So today I'm going to go over some more fun things that we can do with cameras and mixers. Um, so I want to first describe the equipment setup that I have right now. Um, using right now just an analog camera. Analog signal camera in through a mixer, and then that's just run out through another mixer, which is capturing this whole thing and bringing that out to the screen that we're on. So, um, this time, last time we were using a CRT, a broadcast CRT, and I was showing you some fun stuff you can do with that, and I wanted to show you this time uh, what feedback through an LCD looks like. Now, this isn't what every LCD is going to look like, um, they'll all vary, but there are. It's not going to look exactly like this, but there will be some general uh, characteristics that are more likely to happen in this cell. The first thing you can notice is look at these clearly defined lines that are coming down. So this is something that I have seen with CRTs, um, but it doesn't happen as often as it does with LCDs. Just because um, of a couple of reasons, um, the, the the LCD pixel is more discreet than the phosphor on a CRT. Uh, the time delay is always greater than um, plugging a, an electrical signal into the back of a CRT. Because the time that it takes for the CRT to process is like um, it's like the speed of electricity, and the speed that an LCD is processing your signal is the speed of digital. Digital things are slower than like just plugging an analog signal into an analog device that is just mechanically working with the electricity. Um, so yeah, um, that's LCDs aren't the only aspect of how you get the sort of clearly defined like reaction diffusion worm patterns. Um, it will also have to do with the sort of like the depth field between your camera and the screen, if that makes sense. Um, it has to do with how much focus your, how much like resolution your camera is able to handle versus how much resolution your screen has and how much distance there is between them. So I would just advise if you have an LCD in a camera and you want to get this kind of thing, just sort of set them up um, so you can keep moving the camera back and forth as you're focusing in and out. So yeah, and you notice that there's a bit more, the colors are kind of more like brassy and quantized on here in a way and that's like also a pretty LCD thing. This will often depend not necessarily on the LCD but um, it depends on the signal that's going on because any way you slice it when you're putting a signal into an LCD, an analog signal in, there's going to be an analog to digital converter involved which is also part of the delay but part of the analog digital converter is uh, that it can have the uh, after effect, side effect of quantizing your color palette. Because analog signals can work in a more smooth um, color palette. Because they're analog, well, discrete uh, digital systems are going to have steps in them. And it's a question of whether or not that <laughs> whether or not um, the discreteness is liminal or not. But yeah, so that's LCDs. Oh yeah, one more thing. You may notice that in like the general ambient background of this, that everything's brighter. And that is partially because of the lighting that I'm using for shooting this video, but it's also because LCD screens are evenly backlit. And this means that the black, the blackest black on an LCD is not as dark as the blackest black on a CRT. Because a CRT is, uh, if, it, if, if you tell a pixel on a CRT to be black, it's just not going to fire a phosphor, fi fire an electron that triggers a phosphor. But if you tell a, a pixel on an LCD to be black, um, the, the LCD itself is actually transparent. It's a filter that white light is shining through. So the color of black means there's no red, no red, and no green pixel being illuminated, but that doesn't block the ambient light of the backlight. So uh, LCDs will always have a less, less of a dynamic brightness range. There are expensive LCDs which, um, what do you call it? They actually have uh, 
an LED for each uh, pixel. So those I haven't played with, and those sound like they'd be a lot of fun to try. It's the same thing as, I think, organic LED screens. Yeah, LED screens are also uh, work differently. But yeah, so those are some kind of drawbacks. I don't know. It depends on the perspective you're coming from. If you just look at what is happening on the screen right now, I think you can see some really remarkable strengths of working with LCDs because it would be very, very hard to get this kind of slow-moving, oozing growth on a CRT. Uh, although you can sometimes get something close to this when you have a digital camera on a CRT, and I should probably do that set up for the next time. But yeah, so that is LCDs. I'm just going to like enjoy this moment here and goof around with this for a bit. Um, so there is hue shifting happening. There's a lot of rainbow banding, and this is because I am changing the, both the, the color, uh, I'm doing like basic color control stuff through the LCD. I went into the annoying uh, digital menu and jacked up the saturation a bit, played with the brightness and the contrast a bit, and uh, affected the colors. So really anything you do to affect color, affecting hue, like I basically just subtracted a bit of the green because it was tending to be really green and I didn't like that. And I think I pulled out just enough green that it's just sort of evenly, like, color shifting, but with hue shifting, with a slight focus on purple. Um, this camera seems to like purple for some reason. It always purples things up. I'm pretty cool with that. Uh, you'll notice different cameras have sort of different, like, these tiny little quirks. Uh, you really only notice after you, like, play with them for a long time and play with different pieces of equipment. But yeah, so that is LCDs. The next thing I want to talk about is doing stuff with two mixers. So when you have two mixers, uh, things don't just get twice as, it's not like adding another mixer into your signal path doesn't, it's not like a linear addition. It becomes like an exponentially more like complicated thing that you can then play with which is pretty awesome, but it gets really confusing. So when I am working with multiple mixer signal paths, especially if there's like some, like I'm really trying to be intentional and like remembering what I'm doing, I like to make diagrams like this. So you see there's the C, which means a camera, there's S, which means a screen, and then I have the arrows going from mixer one and mixer two. Mixer 1 is the only one working right now, and down at the bottom I have a list of what the settings are for each channel on each mixer and how the channels are being mixed together. So if you take a gander at this, you'll see what I did is I'm taking the signal from the camera, I'm actively splitting it. Actively sp splitting means that it's, I'm not, uh, if I was passively splitting the signal, that would be going through like, let's see. Of these things, Oop. I kicked the thing that was actively uh, splitting the signal. <laughs> so if you have one of these things, you'll see it, uh, it's got a male RCA composite here and two female RCA composites out here. It's passively splitting the signal, that means that you're not boosting it as you split it, you're actually splitting the signal in half. So each signal is going to be half the strength of the original one. And that can actually be a fun thing to work with sometimes. But for the purposes of this one, I wanted to work with an active uh, signal. So uh, I had to run this through a VCR, which has two outputs. Uh, I think that's also adding some of the delay as well, because there is some, I think there's uh, a line TBC, a digital TBC on this VCR as well. So that's going to add a tiny bit of uh, delay to the process in addition to everything else. Yes, yeah, so you notice on this, this here, actively splitting the signal, and I'm running it as an input to both mixer 1 and mixer 2. Check down the effects there, and you'll see on mixer 2, I'm taking this camera signal, I'm going to invert black and white, I'm going to invert the color, I'm going to solarize it, and flip it. Uh, this way, horizontally, 
Yeah, that's horizontal. Flip this way. I drew an arrow on there. I should have just written horizontal because I forget those things. Um, yeah, and then I'm going to, on mixer A, I'm taking the output from mixer 2. Mixer 1, I'm taking the output from mixer 2. I'm going to key it into the black. So I'm going to fade into that, and we can see what that looks like. So that is pretty fun. This is a... This is quite frankly one of my favorite modes to play in. You mess around with the threshold on the key for a moment, so you can see here's the, the, the single channel, and then I'll fade in the inverted one. Now here's just... Let's see. So if you look, you check right on the corner here, see so that one, depending if my hand is white, you'll see little white worms trailing down from it. And if my hand is black, over on the other side of the screen, you see little black worms trailing out. But then they're sort of like, black worms kind of have like a, just like a white outline with the black worms, and there's like hue shifting happening around them. So... Yeah, this is, if you desaturate the whole thing and you just get black and white blobs, it kind of looks like you can get like very uh, roar sharky, yin yang sort of patterns. I call this yin yang blob zone. <laughs> or yin yang worm zone, depending on like where I'm at. We've got blobs and worms happening right now, so that's pretty fun. But yeah, so that's one thing you can do with just, uh, if you have multiple mixers but only one camera, um, you can mix the, the signal this way. You, just have, you actually have to do it this way if you want it to be combined properly. If you wrote it the signal through, if you wrote the camera through one mixer and then sent it back into the other mixer and back in through that, you'd be dealing with an internal loop which would take over from the mixer. And you'll probably play with that one in a future one as well. Oh yeah, there's another thing I wanted to show you. Lenses. So right here, I have a polarizing lens. Uh, polarizing lens, you can get, this doesn't fit exactly over this this camera here. It just kind of loosely sits on there, but you can play with different ways to like, if you, if you just find like polarizing lenses for like random cameras around, you know, it's just kind of like futz with the, uh, Puts with like some tape and cardboard and make like some sort of uh, <clears throat> some sort of way to keep it on. I'm gonna play with a polarizing lens in this setting as well. You'll notice first off what it's doing is it's reducing the overall brightness. Second of off, it seems to be sort of amplifying some colors and muting some other ones. Take a gander. You can see more of the color effects if you just sort of gently move the camera around because the hue shifting is happening from these sort of like the interfering like white and black uh, zones combined with like the, the screen amplifying and attenuating the color signals. But I can sort of build more worms and complex shapes just by very, very gently shifting the camera and slowly steering them where I would like them to be. But when you have a, it's nice to keep a polarizing lens loose on your camera because I'm going to start to turn it now. And you should notice different things happening with the color as I turn it. So I'll hold it right here. It seems to be blocking a lot of the brightness in general. And it's focusing just like these like blobs. You can see sort of around in the corner, uh, like below, there's like the, the, the brightness thresholds are amplifying enough to the point where they're like sort of getting like keyed out by one of the, one of the keying channels.
sometimes just the act of turning it is a bit more dynamic than keeping it on anything. But something in general, which I find to be like a rule of thumb in working with feedback, is just there isn't really a sweet spot where you dial everything in and like it's perfect and it just should stay that way forever. The sweet spot is a range of values when you change something slightly. So you notice like if I just left the camera and I walked away and left this all to do what it's gonna do, it'll more or less kind of like it'll do this sort of like chaotic cycling where it won't 100% repeat everything it's doing, but it'll stay pretty, um, what do you call it? Overall, the behavior won't change remarkably. If you just do like tiny shifts to the camera though, it'll make very large changes overall to the behavior. I have a really nice setting right here, so I'm just going to turn off the P and P with this for a bit. And I think that'll be the end of part one of this session after I'm done playing with it.
So you notice as I focus, as I'm zooming in and out, I can actually change the, the overall color palette. Zooming in is amplifying the sort of blue and green opposing palettes. Whereas when I zoom out more, almost there, then I'm getting a black and white. I don't know why that's happening, but it is happening. All I'm doing really is playing with the polarizing filter angle and zooming in and out and moving the camera very slowly up and down. I'm not changing any settings on the mixers here, I am just playing the camera right now. One of the mixers I'm using is, I do want to take a little moment here to shout out one of my favorite video mixers and the first one I ever got is the Vidionics MX-1 pop back out through this one. It's the Videonics MX-1. It is, generally speaking, the least expensive used SD video mixer you can find out there. It's very digital. It says right on the front of it, it is a digital video mixer. Uh, it means it's doing DSP on the digital. It's not actually mixing digital video together. <laughs> Otherwise, you would not be able to find it for like 80 bucks or whatever. But yes, you can find it for like $80. Um, and it is actually a very highly powered and unique mixer. Um, a lot of people do not like this one because there are not really any knobs on it. There is a digital interface that you have to do like button pressing and like kind of read the manual to like figure out. There's a slider which may or may not have like significant delay depending on your model. And yeah, you need to have one extra little screen for uh, actually doing anything in the menu. You need to have a preview screen out. It is really not hiding the fact that it is a computer, basically. Uh, but it also has, oh well, yeah, it also has a really, really nice time-based corrector. So if you're working with severely out-of-bound signals from a glitch machine or something you have put together yourself, which you know you're overdriving the video signal out of range, uh, it is really nice to have a stable TBC, which you can find in the Videonics, to keep your signal in an allowable zone before it goes out to a screen or a projector. Or a capture device, because none of those things really like to deal with uh, unstable signals. They'll just blue screen or do like some sort of like clumpy digital ch -ch 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 that's really unpleasant. Um, Unless you really like that sort of thing. It's usually frustrating. It's funny because it's something that like video glitch artists have to deal with is the fact that their glitch signal causes an unwanted glitch that they then have to like fix it. They have to stabilize it so their signal does not glitch at the end of it. I find that kind of funny. <laughs> um, anyway though, that's the end of part one and I'll see you for part two.